I'll lift three little blackbirds sitting in a row, Shirley. You might have to move your chairs if it's better. <laughs> Mine don't like that. <laughs> can you sit in the middle, Kate? Yeah, I'll sit in the middle. You can put the row between the two oh, sides. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, Nolene Robbins put the ad in the paper and it was her house where they held the first meeting. The only person I can remember saying they were at that first meeting was Dory Lawson. Dory was very keen and a very keen and a very good researcher. The first one I went to was at the top of the Colac Post Office um, and that was the last one that they had there. After that they went to Calanda um, and then the old historical society um, and then we went to Hesse Street and then eventually we came here. Shirley took myself and my husband into joining but I think it was 1991 and I thoroughly enjoyed it. The best part was all the friendship mm. and, and we loved helping people find their ancestors. Well, somebody said to me, um, who was your father, who was your grandfather, and I, I was going well, uh, who was your great grandfather, and I didn't have a clue. So I thought, I, I'd better find out. Um, then, I think it was about 1984, I would have first come to a genealogical society meeting um, that was held at that stage above the old post office. Uh, the president at the time, uh, Lance, I think actually worked for the post office and we had access to upstairs to hold our meetings. Would you like to stand for president? Lance has sort of been president ever since and you know, he might want a break. I said no, 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 not me. Um, I said I'll come along to the annual meeting and you know, we'll just see what happens and anyway, the call for nominations for president and I can't remember who's here, oh, Kevin Swanson, and they basically said, oh, Carrie, Kevin, you're it. Oh, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> we sort of had to get out of the post office, and I worked at Calanda. Um, at that stage, the education department had a school up there, and uh, I knew the principal fairly well. Um, I negotiated with him that um, Tuesday nights we have meetings, we had nowhere to go. Um, would, they, uh, would he be prepared to let us use the school, uh, which was heated and the good thing about it, it had a little kitchenette and we didn't have to bring tea and coffee, uh, which was great. Uh, I can't recall where the first set of microfiche yeah, came Price. from. Stan Price bought them. Stan Price, that's right. Stan Price purchased them because we were battling a bit. We had we acquired some second-hand microfiche readers and um, by the time we could buy another set of microfiche, correct me if I'm wrong girls, uh, we were able to use the first set to put out on loan to members, members only and they could take the microfiche home for a one week. And, the and microfiche the and the reader, reader yeah. home for one week. And then return it at the end of the week for the next member to take. And that was very beneficial. We gathered a lot of information that way. And Kate started a card file where we entered every bit of information onto a card yeah. file just made it easier if somebody came in and they wanted to look up their ancestors. We started with a surname file and what we had what we had on those um, on those those surnames and it helped a lot, yeah. And the first computer we had was on loan from the cemetery trust, wasn't it? Yeah. To it find was. out who was buried in the actual public mm. cemetery. They loaned us a computer before we ever owned a computer.
many members walked the cemetery to number the graves mm. and the rows. We did that for a long, long time. Quite a several of the members did that. And that was so people could go and find the burial place a lot easier. Mm. But uh, from the computer that we uh, had on loan, we could help other people then find if their ancestors were buried here and what year they died. I, I know when I first started in the group in 84, uh, a person by the name of Russell Lucas had done the St John's Church in Colac uh, and they were in the typed out on sheets and there was only um, basically who the two people were and the date, that was about it. Uh, they were the only records that the group, apart from the written thing on the cemetery, that was the only records we actually had. Uh, at that stage. Kate was an organiser for raising a lot of money. For the, yes, I was thinking about that this morning. Trivia nights. And I was thinking about, we did um, Super 66, we did yeah. Lila. We Lila. did Phillips. selling socks, we did the, the chocolate <laughs> ones, we did um, street stalls. I remember the street stalls <laughs> outside uh, Ray Crofts one year. My fig tree had an enormous amount of figs on it and I pickled figs and bottled them. <laughs> no one knew what pickled figs were <laughs> and I went home with a load, <laughs> a load of pickled figs that didn't sell. <laughs> <laughs> Casserole teas, yeah, trivia so nights, mm. seminars. Oh. Seminars, we didn't intend to make money, but we usually did. Yeah, we sort of started the seminars to, because it was then, so so much trouble to get to Melbourne, we decided we'd bring the specialists in different subjects to Colac. And that, that got a whole new range of people that had come along as well, so we got more members by doing that. And they um, travelled from near and far to... Yeah. To yeah. come to the seminar, we'd have the room full. Yeah. Chockers. One might speak on immigration, and another one on another subject. Public record. Obviously. We had yeah. um, skin divers that had dived on local wrecks who, and brought along a lot of their artefacts that they had. We had some very interesting speakers. Mm. One of the early members of the group was Stan Price. Stan was on the board, the hospital board, uh, which gave us a leg in because we knew the hospital had records. I'd heard about it, I hadn't seen it. Uh, they dated back to uh, year dot, really. Um, the, we met with the board. The board gave us very clear guidelines that, of what information we were allowed to uh, copy and what information we weren't allowed to copy. Uh, and as per usual, the information you weren't allowed to copy was far more interesting than what you were allowed to copy. Um, we had a lot of members very, very willing to come up and help us with the uh, transcribing the hospital records, uh, mainly for their own benefit because they'd go up and peruse what uh, great-grandfather was in, in there for, uh, shock, horror, you know, some of the... Uh, illnesses they had at that stage. Um, look, it, it was hard work uh, to pencil it out, uh, copy it out. Uh, a lot of it in the early days was old inkwell pens and some of it uh, just looked like a fly crawled out of an inkwell over a page. Um, interesting, hard work but interesting and as I said before just worth its weight in gold. These people in particularly the hospital records may not have been born in Colang, they may not have died in Colang but they were here and if they were here we need to know. Yeah to access the hospital records up to 1920 um, so to do that we used to have to get the books and take them and take them up to the old nurse's home and um, sit there and do it all transcribe by hand them. and transcribe them out. Some of the writing was terrible and we ended up with some interesting names and comments. Uh, but the most interesting thing I think were the older ones which they actually put where they were born, where they came from and the name of the ship that they came out to Australia in which really helped 
people if they were, they were looking for their ancestors. And they, Gave a lot yeah. of people a starting point. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Well, we, when we moved in, I think it was June 2001, June or July, the size of the room made a big difference to both us and the Historical Society. And we had access to the records that the older ones had previously, or the older members had previously done, and it was great help to everyone. But we always had people coming in. People had come through every day we were open. We found that we had to have more than one person here assisting in the finish. It was so busy. And they came from all over Australia because we we changed, exchanged newsletters with every group in Australia, most of the big groups throughout Australia, family history groups. And that's how uh, people got their information then. There was no such thing as sending them an email or <laughs> never heard of it. Uh, Kate being secretary, who knew she picked up the mail from the post office and we went through them. Any item we found that was interesting was written down or made note of. And um, people would borrow, at times our older, Kate kept our newsletters and they, people would borrow them to read, especially in the, from the areas that they'd come from themselves. And uh, our own newsletters were very interesting. Our <laughs> secretary of, here. Bit of cut and, cut and pasting, <laughs> photocopying, <laughs> photocopying again. Over about 200, I can remember standing at that yeah. old photocopy, 200 odd newsletters with so many pages in them. And then all the envelopes had to be addressed yeah, by hand, stamped. And, stamped. Yeah. and uh, we all stamped the backs of every envelope with our own stamp <laughs> to say where they were from. They t that took hours, didn't yeah, it? And didn't they, but it got put out every three months without fail, thanks to Catherine. <laughs> no, thanks to everybody that assisted, I think. We had quite a few different little committees that sort of did things. Subcommittees. Like, um, yeah, subcommittees, which um, which was handy. Committees within yeah. the committee, yeah. so, so to speak. Yeah. In the general committee. And it was people that were interested in the certain... like Aspect yeah, of... Yeah, that they joined The that. operation. Yeah which was good. Yeah. Uh, I was secretary probably 18 years and I thought I'd never get out of <laughs> No one else wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually, yeah, I did. But no, it was, it was good. I did enjoy it. See, everyone got their newsletter posted to them because that's the way it had to go out. Um, another thing that I'd like to mention was our window displays, which were very, very well done. And one of our members in later years, Margaret Finlay, did a great job of all our window displays, with assistance from Liz mainly, but it was very, very good. People were always interested in our window displays. It's a lot of work in it, Kate, but we found it fun. Yeah, and it I mean, fun. you made really good friends. Yeah, and it was fun, and it was so good helping people. Oh, it wasn't, that, I, I think that was the best part of it. Yeah. If you found something to help people that they didn't know, they were so, you know, yeah. there'd be tears and everything else. But yes, it everyone was shared great. their research. As much as anything, we were all interested in family history, so everyone was interested in your story as much as you were in your own. Mm -hmm. I can recall on one occasion, Dory researching a branch of the family. This went back to quite early in her family research. And I thought at the time, that's the most amazing story I've heard. That would ri rival Picnic at Hanging Rock. It would <laughs> make a film. It really would. And I still think that today, that it would make a wonderful Australian film. It was a real mystery. And Dory, at that stage, I remember she was so into this research. She hopped on the, on the train the next day, went down to Melbourne to the public library and found it all in the papers down there. She came across just this something that grabbed her and thought, I've got to find out about that. Mm -hmm. So she, next morning she was on the train and down to Melbourne to the public library and came home with it that night. Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah she it was just, about yeah. a family. Yeah. family. She, oh, she was... But before the group was even the got started, Dory used to go by train to Melbourne to the research, didn't she? She well, well Dory, was on the train. The, Dory was the one that she was sorted one. out the Wailangta Cemetery, wasn't she? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so Dory had kept that gone. personal record of the, for her own satisfaction to start with because she knew so many families that were involved with the cemetery and because it was she was local to the area. But that was so wonderful in later years because 
it was so valuable. Look through the cemetery. We we did a terrible lot of cemetery trips. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot. Well, that was our yeah. one of our treasures. Yeah. Uh, Margaret Reed from Winchelsea. She used to her job was to organise a, a cemetery mm. trip, and we did Linton, Ballarat, not Ballarat itself, uh, Port Campbell, Scotts Creek, Camperdown. What was the other way out back at camp? Oh, we did a heck of a lot of cemetery trips. Through. We, we'd hire a bus. And one of our members, Ron Campbell, who is now deceased, he was a bus driver nominated for the day and we'd spend the whole day doing cemetery crawls. <laughs> Maybe we went to Yorga one time too. Oh, we had a picnic Yorga. Lunch. Yeah, we had <laughs> sat on the graves at Yorga at Forest and <laughs> ate our lunch. Yeah. We yeah. had some great trips. Yeah. And Liz went with us. She drove most of us, the two or three of us, every so many months to a Geelong historical meetings in Geelong where we met at different places and uh, that was always a good day. Well I originally started off as a member of the Historical Society. Uh, if there was no one who came in when I was on duty, I was using the Family History's microfiche because I got interested a couple of years earlier and uh, that way I became, decided I'd better become a member. And then becoming a member got put onto the committee and then other things came up and we had a few maps. I knew the historical had more, they got, they'd got them from Johnson's at one stage. So I went to Stewart's and some of them were pretty big so I got to the council to put them through the planner. So I got more maps then from the council that they had and they got some of the ones I got. Then. Uh, when Power Corps closed their office in Carlac, we were invited down to see if we wanted anything. And there was a whole box of parish maps from Warn, from Warn Ponds to the South Australian border up to the Hamilton Highway. They weren't all there, but they were a big selection of maps, which really boosted our group. Uh, the schools, which I was involved in, uh, one of the members brought in the Colac East registers, photocopied, that left the uh, personal stuff as the marks or grades of the, the children out, but it gave the child's name, the date of birth, their parents or guardian, and occupation of that, and how far from the school they were. So I ended up getting the job then of going around all the schools. Uh, there were some humorous times, like uh, one school, the principal said, yes, yes, sure, but they're in this locked cabin, we haven't got a key. So he got a hammer and punch, he uh, knocked the two pins out of the two hinges, took the door off, so we got the school registers out, <laughs> photocopied to what we wanted, put them back, and just as we got the last pin back in the hinges, one of the uh, staff said, what are you doing? And he said, we haven't got a key. And he said, oh, that's that key over there. So we wasted quite a bit of time <laughs> doing that. That was the most humorous one. <laughs> you drew that up, the form that we sent out to people to we get information. We put a piece in the paper requesting uh -huh. people come forward and bring uh, photos of their... Um, soldier forebears and pick up a form and fill it in give us the details they had. Unfortunately like many things that you appeal for <laughs> everyone that reads it thinks oh that applies to someone else it doesn't apply to me. So to begin with it was very slow to start and I did a, started myself appealing to people that I knew personally who had fathers and uncles in the First World War and the Boer War, and that's, they were mainly Otway people. And because I didn't move to Carlac till 1970, so my childhood was spelt, spent down there, and I knew quite a lot of the families and the early servicemen from the First World War. And that's the way I began. And it just grew from that. It's like Topsy, it grew and it grew. And oh. people that were coming in here to do research, I'd 
hop onto them and ask them if they had any. And they were very obliging, but in many cases you found that you're going back in photography when you're asking for photos of First World War men and Boer War men. Uh, in many cases there was often only ever one photo in the, in the home. M mother had that hanging above the fireplace. And of course when mother died, the photo went somewhere else. It might have gone to Western Australia to the eldest son or wherever. And the other members of the family, the other family members, were left out. They didn't have one. Many times people would say, oh, I believe there was a photo, but we, don't, we haven't got it, or we've never seen it. Or... And by this time, there were three photographers in Colac that were copying old photos and giving re reproductions. And I thought, well, that would be a, a great thing if we got a, a good collection of photographs. When people come in to do their research, we could get these photos copied for them. And many a trip I had on foot round the, <laughs> the, the camera shops getting photos copied for a certain researcher that they'd pay for the photos and um, go away happy because I now had a photo that they didn't have before to add to their family files. And so it just grew in momentum from there. And um, found that once you showed them the albums of photos, they, people were more responsive to, to contributing. Uh, they'd think, oh yes, I wouldn't mind, you know, Great Uncle Jack going in there or whatever. Photographs and the forms were placed together in, the, in a pocket in the files, in alphabetical order, which was easy to access. I'm not um, very proficient when it comes to do any, doing anything other than manually, <laughs> I'm afraid. I have no computer skills. Um, it was, uh, that's where I greatly admired Dory at her age, uh, that she took to the computer and she, she was dogged in her determined to, to learn to use that computer, which she did. But I, I was never as smart as that, <laughs> I'm afraid. You were smart. <laughs> you were born smart, surely. Yes. <laughs> The ashes. Well, the ashes came by the fact that we had a copy of the cemetery records and they were well used. They were being used all the time and whoever was doing the research uh, and answering the letters were using the ashes to a great extent. And I thought, well, what happens with people these days? There's such a big percentage of people being cremated what happens for the records of where, where the ashes were placed. Some are placed in cemeteries, some are placed in, in plots in cemeteries, some are placed in uh, walls of remembrance, some are scattered. And how are families going to know, and the heads of the families are gone, where Great Aunt Mary's uh, ashes were scattered? Um, so from that, we just started, I just started up a cemetery register, uh, ashes register. And um, today there's a lot more ashes being placed, I think, in cemeteries than there are being scattered because people want uh, a place to visit. They, yeah. In their memory, they think, well, we know where they are. Why fill in a form to, mm. you know, everyone hates forms. Let's face it, everyone mm. hates filling in forms. And that would, I did think that would people put, did put people off. I know when Sandra came along in particular, Molly, uh, Loretta Porter, people like that, uh, we had to work out how we were going to get money because we needed money. You have to have it. Um, the microfish were coming out. Um, we needed microfish readers. We had to buy the microfish itself. Um, so. We thought, how are we going to get money? So we printed up sheets and 
sent them out to people and people come and collected them, they filled it in, we compiled all the information and we printed the first Pioneer Register, which, um, yeah, uh, was a great uh, money spinner. We collected all that, then we spent that pretty quickly. Well, um, all right, so our first publication was the Pioneer Register. First I one. only came in when they were editing it. Um, the next was a, quite a few years later, and that was the second Pioneer Register. Oh, hang on, no, I beg your pardon. In between that, there was a hand-me-down recipe book that we needed money, so we decided we'd do a recipe book. And Shirley named it. Yes, and it worked, went very well. We had old recipes from people's families from all over Australia, didn't we? Yeah, we, we had some good cooks amongst the group, and so often when someone was complimented on a slice or cake or whatever, they'd say, oh, that was my great aunt, great Aunt Mary's cake. We call that such and such a cake in our house or such and such a biscuit. And um, that was when we were looking at raising money and I said, well, perhaps we could do a hand-me-down cookbook, which is what we did and the members all contributed. Uh, we asked them to put in a little personal note on on who originally had the recipe. Some did. I was a little disappointed that some didn't. Um, I remember it was well received. It was quite well received. I remember a knock at the door one day and I went out and this lady introduced herself. I'd never seen her before. And she said, oh, I'm Jenny Bowker from Princetown. You put a, a recipe book, a recipe in your hand-me-down recipe book called Bowker Biscuits. Everyone made about it. And um, I said, yes, they were... Well, I think at that stage my sister, who was in her well into her 80s, was still making these biscuits. And everyone in the family liked them. They were just one of the old soda biscuits, commonly known as soda biscuits. And she said, oh, she said, I was so thrilled to read that the family biscuits were. And it turned out my father's eldest sister and one of the Bowker girls were great friends from, girl, from girlhood. And one had lent the other the recipe and it had stayed in the family, in our family. So she was thrilled to find sold a lot of copies. Do you remember how, how many came? No, I don't, but I remember I ended up with a little parcel from a man down near Geelong of uh, horse, horse radish sauce or something. It's just this tiny, tiny little bottle. But yeah, no. And I think we might have put that one. It was the first one we put in the Weekly Times asking for recipes. Yeah, we advertised that. We advertised that in the Weekly, Times. That in oh, the weekly yeah. Times. Yes, yeah. I think we did. Yeah. Yes, that's and true. And then, Kate, what about your Pioneer Women's Book? Yeah, the Pioneer... The Not the Register. Oh, the Pioneer one. Women's... Because we did the second Pioneer Register and then we did the Pioneer, Pioneer Women. Women Stories. Yeah. Stories, which was probably... Oh. 2013 it, it came out. Did it? Yeah. Yeah. I so remember the amount of work that Pioneer Women's Register made. Oh, Molly was nearly tearing her hair out <laughs> reading through those stories. I got the job of reading the articles yes. and still made mistakes. <laughs> it took a long time. She went over and over and over those stories. Um, we do, we do a proofreader, have, how's that sound? We, we do have a, a few problems when you'd say, you know, just a, a story of their lives, like it was a woman's life um, and some people would virtually write a book and send it to us you had to cut um, it down. and we had to explain to them nicely that we couldn't use it all and we tried to sort of Edited. make it smaller but um, yeah we got a good reception it was also yeah in the weekly times we advertised it um, but yeah that was the last one I, I had anything to do with so we were forever yeah. ordering another um, Another edition. And Another yeah, edition from yeah. the Tarang printers, weren't we? Star printers at Tarang. Yeah. Once we started to get down on them, we'd have to order another. Yeah, because at that stage, people were reading. They weren't using computers, they mm. were reading. <laughs> yeah.
So you never had a problem with money then? Well, we all found money. <laughs> we all managed to make yeah. enough to get us through to the next year. As soon as we found enough money, we knew what we were going to spend it on. Well, our treasure yeah. at that stage was a Scottish descent. No, yes, we had a Scottish treasure. She could run money like nobody yeah. could run money. She was excellent. <laughs> when I originally joined, it was about 1996 to 7, somewhere around then. And we were in the old historical buildings. Then we went, which were downstairs. Then in 1999, we were moved out down to Shop 2 in the Otway Plaza because they were doing the demolishing those rooms to build Copac. Then we, in, while we were there, I was president, and they uh, in 2001, we signed the new building's uh, lease. So that's where we are at the moment, in this new Copac history room. All the collect... 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 <laughs> collect ge Genealogical, Genealogical Society. Society. So many people thought it was to do with the women having babies. That <laughs> <laughs> eventually, Kevin spoke up, <laughs> I think, was it a lot of us? Mm. And we got to change the Colac and District Family History Group, which wasn't anywhere near as interesting. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it, it actually, to me, it, it sounds a lot better because it's yeah. it's not just numbers and names and whatever. No, it's like it's the whole. Yeah. And history. in England, they didn't go in for any fancy names for any of their groups through the counties either. They nearly all called their their groups family history groups. Mm -hmm. We used to have our uh, Christmas teas. We used to have casserole teas, which was in about July. August. So winter, July, July. August, a winter like event, that. yeah. yeah um, Always held in a hall, not quite, here. Quite often we had um, uh, anniversary dinners. Uh, we'd go to a hotel and a, a lot of us would, would go for... So just cooking. <laughs> yeah, for, for, and, and we'd ha hand out like life memberships or things like that. Had them, didn't we? Mm. Yeah. Yes, usually yeah. at the anniversary yeah. dinner, some people who were entitled to be yeah. called a life member become a oh, life member. So, how yeah, true you're not. So, uh, <laughs> they were a good money yes, raiser. Yes, they were, they were good. I, I must say, so many of the smaller local businesses used to help us out there. Mm. We used From, to walk Murray yeah. Street. But and the, down the there, smaller, when you think about but it, the smaller them, ones, yeah, were, were, the little ones that gave the most. Yeah, they were. They because were in those days, the you couldn't ask the uh, collectarian company because they were all by then a big company. You know, mm. uh, Target was run by a head office in Melbourne. Uh, all those different things come into it. But the smaller businesses mm. in Collect were always willing. You'd walk in and they say, "Oh God, it's years again." <laughs> and. Um, then you had to go back and pick up the uh, donation, donated gift when they had it ready for you. So it was a double trip around Murray Street. I think I learned a lot more businesses in Colwick than yeah. from one end of Murray Street. Up with that, that many presents. Everybody used to love coming to the... Uh, because everyone won yeah. a prize in the finish. It was that yeah. many. It was yeah, great. No, it was, they were really good, good nights. Yeah, they true. were. And they, they got not just members in, but other people in mm. as well, which is what we wanted, you know, to include mm. more in the community into... What, what we did. So it's a very social thing as yeah. well. Oh, yeah, well, that's yeah, right yeah. about it. I found right from the very start. The minute you walked in the door, someone made you welcome, whether they hated you or otherwise, <laughs> no one hated each other. Yeah. Uh, I would long to say that. We were very made, every, we were made very, very welcome and um, we made people welcome, which you'd have people come in on the open day and they wouldn't be, they'd be still here in the afternoon. I mean, <laughs> we, we'd be sort of closed doing doing stuff and people would knock still on the door in. <laughs> and you'd sort of think, oh, and then you'd say, oh no, come in and you'd sort of try and help them and yeah, yeah. sometimes you, you learnt many things and they, they learnt a lot as well. Mm. So it was, yeah. no, it was good. Still good, thank goodness, it is still going. <laughs> it is. When we held the seminars, I think the first one was at the Guide Hall. Was that right? Mm -hmm. We had a few at the Guide Hall and we went from the Guide Hall to Ray Street. Yeah, Skill Connection. Skill Connections, is that what it was mm. called? Yeah. And then we went, after that we went to St Mary's. St Mary's was good. We had quite a few there and then we went to St Andrews, mm. was the last one that, that we had. Um, we'd normally have about four speakers for the day. We'd have a speaker, morning tea, another speaker, lunch, another speaker, afternoon tea, and the final speaker. 
um, which was the one we usually If anyone call. wanted a cup of tea before they went home, they welcome yeah, to put the but, jug on yeah. and make We it. tried to make the last week of someone like, she, uh, who was she from Geelong? Yeah, Just, somebody to keep people awake. They were so bright and breezy, <laughs> everyone was woke, woke up by then. Um, Susie Zader. Susie Zader. Yes, oh, Susie yeah. Zader was worth a weight in gold. <laughs> Margaret, uh, Margaret Richardson from the showground. Richardson, Margaret Richardson. Richardson, you fall asleep, asleep every time. <laughs> it doesn't matter. She was a member. She was in charge. She was, too. but she was oh, most ardent note taker I've ever oh, known yeah. in all my life. Yeah. She'd spend hours taking notes. And we sold books. We sold a lot of our publications. And other people brought yeah, the, the, the Pam well. Jennings, who did a lot of books mm. from down around the Geelong group. She'd have her own table. Everyone was allowed, groups were allowed to have their tables. And the, the GSV, they brought GSV books. GSV, all yeah, provide sometimes. books. Or, um, yeah. And uh, we were able to sell all them. We made quite a good number of sales at our seminars. Yeah, no, it was, it was no, it was, Kate was the organiser. We just oh, we but there was so much work that everybody did. That, you know, had to set it up. Some of the speakers oh. from GSV they'd come down loaded with books to give away, back copies and things to the new members who hadn't a lot of research material oh. at home. They could go home with an armful of uh, magazines, and and they were very happy. And Ada directly OLD speaker. Ada came back year after yeah, year. I had to meet her at the station. We had to provide accommodation. Yeah. <laughs> but she was marvellous. She was an elder yeah. lady. Kate worked so hard in getting, trying to get a variety of speakers every year. Um, it was, they were really good. They were well attended. People had come from Tring and, you know, all over. Well, well done. Oh, no. well, I couldn't have done it without everybody else. So I know, like that, everybody but you were the pitched in yeah. together. Yeah, but yeah. you used you all the brain power yeah. getting it together, Kate. Yeah. I think I had the honour. I was the first and only person to take the baptismal register out of the Catholic Church in about 130 years. Uh, you must have records. Um, uh, anything happens, nobody else is going to have a copy. These are history. Uh, then he took me and showed me the baptismal register, I think, from memory, start about 1855 or something like that. And it was all handwritten and I thought, this, this has to be copied, um, which I did. I pencilled it out uh, and then I had a, uh, one of the members was Diane Parker. She come along and she said, Kevin, you write it out, I'll put it on computer. Yes, yeah, some of our best days and best trips were to the public records office. It took us a while to find our way around, but um, once we got into the routine of using our lockers and all those things, uh, it, they were great days. We came home with a lot of information from down there. And we used to be always so happy to share with each other what we... What we used we to go to Cherry Lane at Laverton, that was the public records office before they closed yeah, that and yeah. moved to Melbourne, to North, North Melbourne. Melbourne. Yeah. Mm. We used to go. Kevin used to drive a bus occasionally, didn't mm, he? And we went did. by cars yeah. and that to Laverton all yeah. organised days out. To what about camp. other groups? We went to, I can remember going to Terang. Camperdown? Yes. Yeah. Went to Terang and some ended up going to Nurat as well yes. to check, thing, check things out there. And it was, yeah, it was good visiting other groups and, and um, you seeing got what they had, seeing how they ran their you groups. You got ideas yeah. from other groups. Yeah. And then when we, we used to have speakers, um, we, we'd um, send them all, let them know that they were coming and we'd have some from Geelong had come, some from Durang had come, you know. At, at Warnable? Yeah. yeah, sometimes Warnable had come too, just for the different speakers that were here. I think everyone got something out of it, everyone, mm -hmm. you know, too. I don't think anyone went away disappointed that they hadn't heard anything or mm. uh, hadn't heard what they wanted to or found out something. Some of our old, mem old members um, no longer with us and um, a lot of their memories have gone, of course, of what the groups were like. Betty Baker and Joy Rourke and... Um, Loretta Porter. Loretta Porter. Yeah. They were very active members and... You know, their memories are all gone.
Well, no, so we used to open Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoon. Mm. We worked Mondays and Tuesdays, which the girls were still doing. We were meant to work from 10 to 2 on a Monday and a Tuesday, but... <laughs> Never that, it was always later. <laughs> and uh, then because of football and everything else, we found Saturdays were a bit of a place being open to the public. So we opened like they still do, Thursday, Friday and Saturday afternoon. Sunday afternoon. Yeah, Sunday, not Saturday. We closed Saturday afternoon yeah, and worked on the Mondays and Tuesdays and whenever else we could fit time in, but you didn't have much time to do uh, anything else. You didn't have a lot of time and to do And you were rostered own. on, as I was going to say, Shirley was doing the roster at one stage and she sent us a copy of the roster and hopefully the day that we preferred to do. I remember doing every second Friday, Ian Whitecross used to do the other Friday and that went on for several years, but all the other members always did duty on the days that they were lost. If they couldn't, what did Deborah say? It was up to you to change it yourself. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't ring the coordinator. You rang another member and said, look, I can't do duty that day for some reason. Can you do it for me? And people usually swapped around that way. If they They're a bit be. like nurses swapping shifts, you know. Oh, yeah. Well, my family were people that have lived in the odd base um, since part of the odd base was open. My father's uh, family, they came in by boat in uh, just a little catch, it was, that they'd hired in Williamstown. They were living in Melbourne and took up land down there, got a little catch and travelled round the coast naively thinking that they could just pull in anywhere and unload and, and go on to their selection. Of course, the coast wasn't really the type of coast you could do that. So they um, <laughs> come to grief on the coast and um, Grandma was tipped out of the boat and trying to get ashore and along with three of the kids. But eventually they made it. They lived through flood and fire and everything else. Um, so I come from Bushstock. Prior to that they'd, they were English and they'd been shipwrecked on the southern coast on the way out to Australia and left destitute. There was uh, great-grandfather, great-grandmother and, and seven children and they were uh, washed up on the beach at Barwon Heads and made their way to Geelong and that's where they settled. So uh, my mother's side of the family were light have Her father was a lighthouse keeper at Cape Otway. Um, and they were people that um, came from Queenscliff and they all earned their living from the sea. There were three fishermen and a, and a marine diver and a lighthouse keeper out of the five children. On oh, no, my, my father's side of the family, both my grandparents were Irish, come out here as single people, married here, married at Croy and had 12 children. My father was the second eldest of 12 children. And uh, then eventually they selected land in the Otways and travelled there in a wagon, horse-drawn wagon, and most of them grew up in the Otways. All rode horses, rode horses to race meetings on the beach at Johanna and raced the horses and then rode back to Wangerip, as it was called in those days. And we were all born in the Otways. I was born at Lavis Hill thanks to Shirley's mother being one of the assistants <laughs> at my birth. <laughs> and um, that was all we knew. I only knew from uh, a school teacher who we only had one school teacher at the school uh, asking something about our, our parents and one of my sisters saying, I don't know about my father, he's got one green eye and one brown eye. <laughs> so, of course we couldn't wait to go home and say to him, and because he had Irish ancestors, he was quite entitled to have one brown eye, he said, and one green eye. <laughs> and he had lots of Irish sayings, but we were, we just, you just knew it. that was all there was. But I, that's why I became really interested. I wanted to know where they came from and how they got here, and which they came out on ships and took months and months, as Cheryl knows, with her family mm -hmm. to arrive. But they seemed to settle up in what they called Irish country up around Corrod. I love the area up there, it's beautiful. Um, my, on Dad's side, my great-great-grandfather, he jumped ship, he was Norwegian, he jumped ship and he went to the gold fields. Um, 
and he had a wagon business there. Anyway, he ended up at Coingi Bora. Um, so that was a, that was a lot of um, forest area, wood area. So um, his son, my grandfather, came down to Beach Forest, follow the wood, follow. And so did a lot of other people, didn't they? Yeah, that's right. Dory loved Dory. Dory had Coingibora yeah, in yeah, her background. Yeah. Came down um, on on my dad's mother's side. Um, it went back to he was a first fleeter on on Norfolk Island, that's right. and his grandson came from Tech because they'd gone to Tasmania. His grandson came to uh, Port Ferry uh, with the whalers and that's where he, he started. Okay, so what yeah. did they call an ancestor on Norfolk Island? They used to say a name, oh, Olive. Yeah. She was Olive. Oh uh, yeah, because of the two, the, the, um, both that were the first fleeters, they, they ended up together. And he was Nathaniel Lucas and she was Olive Gaskell or Olivia Gascoigne. And one day I was looking for records here and you know how they just, they wrote as things sounded. And I eventually found her in one of the records but she was H-O-L-I-F-F, Holof, <laughs> instead of Olivia or, or yeah. So. Mm, people wrote things down, like on shipping records. Yeah, so you could, like, mm. that's something you'd have to be careful of, how things were spelt because it was Quite as people wrong. wrote <laughs> wrote them how they, they heard it. And all the different accents like yeah. you think you know even English Scottish yeah. Irish you're all coming here and someone trying to write down what they were saying yeah. see my ancestors according to history were Dowd D-O-W-D but suddenly all of a sudden they've got an O in front of it with an apostrophe and it was because John son of Dowd mm. or William son of Dowd and that's yeah. how we became O'Dowd. <laughs> Young woman looking for a father mm -hmm. And that caused quite a stir. Uh, her father had been a seaman during the war. And she found out who he was and where he came from. And she came in looking to locate him, which we eventually did. Remember that? That caused a stir. We don't, you didn't have too many turn up on the doorstep looking to find a parent. That was one case and we did more story. <laughs> we had one too, didn't we, Molly? That we, oh. we chased down and um, eventually <clears throat> we found the father had lived for years just in the next suburb to the mm -hmm. to the son. And anyway we we said we didn't tell him exactly where but we we did sort of so we, we so decided no he history. could decide what he wanted. When you to start do. doing family history, you have to take skeletons and all, as we tried to explain. We had a lady when we were in the building underneath here come in uh, and uh, she asked us to promise her we would not help her daughter do family history. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. Because she knew what was happening. Well, if you're going to do family history, you're going to find out all, mm. the, good, all the good and all the bad. I mean, that's part that's of it. part of it. Yeah. Yeah, so they say if you're um, not prepared for what you're going to find, don't, don't do start. It. Don't even start. <laughs> You've got to be prepared to approach it with an open mind for what you might find. Uh, I see that we planted a little acorn thing when we were President Secretary, and then you come in years later like now, and here's this great oak tree. Dory Lawson was a marvellous member turned up here every day that the place was open as far as I can remember. Took on all the research in later years after Betty Tucker stopped doing it. Got fined for a car being parked out there too long, how many times? Yes, um, many times. Many times, <laughs> times but was such a marvellous researcher and so interested in anything to do with family history. We miss her terribly. And she was like a dog with a bone, wasn't she? Oh, there was she no never let anything give up. go. No. <laughs> Just keep, keep you could going. Go, I could going. go to her house because she had her own computer and at times ask her questions and she'd always come up with an answer. Mm. <laughs> uh, she was yeah. Yeah. marvellous. Yeah, it was good. And then you did all the um, school uh, church, rec church records. 
and yeah, you did the school the church, ones, yeah. you did the church records. Yeah, the church records. From they different were, churches. For they were mainly uh, just, well, photocopied yeah. for a start. Mm -hmm. um, oh, no, sometimes we had to, to do them as well, didn't we? We mm -hmm. had to write them all out. Yeah, so it was all by hand at the beginning. But you got a wealth of knowledge out of everything that we that we got that was local for anybody that wanted to, to trace their families.